Hello everybody and welcome to how to build a Bretonian armies. In this video I'm going to show you how to build armies for Bretonia at every single stage of the game. But first things first, let's go through the main army strengths and weaknesses. So first of all the strengths. Obviously they have a very strong focus on cavalry, so have the most powerful charge in the game. And despite being weak, their ranged units can actually focus fire almost anything down pretty quickly with a large unit size and plenty of ammo. And finally their lords immediately gain mounts, so you'll have an advantage early on before anyone else can get them. As for the weaknesses, Obviously, a strong focus on cav means a ton of micromanagement, so if you struggle with that, then this is not going to be a great faction for you, and it's why I don't like them very much. Also, a lot of their early game units are basically drafted peasants, so have terrible stats and will run almost immediately once they've taken a modicum of damage. Most units aren't cav are also pretty sucky, so if you don't want to rely on cav, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. Now let's go into our early game composition. For this, we have access to tier 0 units, which are just the Lords, which are Lords and Prophetesses of Heavens, Beasts and Life and tier 1 units, which are men-at-arms, spear-men-at-arms, mounted yeomen, mounted yeoman archers, peasant mobs, and peasant bowmen. For my early game composition, I'm going to lead them with a lord. I'm going to go with these guys since they're better fighters than paladins, and we can pick up spellcasters later, so we won't be missing out on magical power for long. Like any generic fighting lord, he'll do just fine in general combat and not be too bad in duels, but anyone legendary or specialising in duels, and he'll need some support. Obviously, like any Bretonian, he starts in a mount, so can assist in cav charges or get in sustained combat and do well at either. For the front lines, we're going to go with six spear men at arms. Go with six of these guys since they have better defense than regular men at arms, and even if they have less damage, that really isn't the reason I'm bringing them. They're going to hold the line and keep the enemy still and away from your ranged troops to let them and your cav do all of the damage. Speaking of which, we're going to go with six peasant bowmen. They may be peasants, but they are numerous and have a ton of ammo, and when you add it up, all their shots, they do an impressive amount of damage for something so basic. If you can get them focus firing on the biggest threats, they should fall nice and fast, and then move them on to the next target going to go with four mounted yeomen. These are piss weak cavalry, but we don't have much choice at this stage. Keep them on the move and charging around the enemy back lines and into the backs of their front lines to break them nice and fast. Leadership and longevity, not really something that this army excels at, so rush taking them down before you get whacked. Finally closing us out with three mounted yeomen archers. Keep them on skirmish and get them around the enemy backs to fire into the back of their melee troops to chip away their HP and leadership with zero risk to your own troops. Don't get them involved in melee against anything that isn't retreating or they will lose and you should be just fine. The strengths of this army, we have a lot of range to throw at the enemy, and even if the individual damage isn't great, it adds up. The Lord also gets a mount right out of the gate, so he's mobile and can do some great work either on the move or in sustained combat. And finally, the cav is super fast, so anything short of Warhounds will not be able to take them down. As for the weaknesses, poor leadership all around. There isn't a unit in sight that wants to be here, and once they take even some minor hits, they will turn tail. The cav are also very weak in damage and defense, so if you mess up their micro, they're going to fall extremely fast. And finally, there's not really much damage. Even your range damage is weak if it isn't laser focused on specific targets. So you're going to struggle against anyone that has much armor. Coming to the mid game now, for this we have access to tier 2 units. These are men at arms shields, spear men at arms shields, nice errants, paladins, field trebuchets, and peasant bowmen with fire and pox arrows. And tier 3 units, which are pole men at arms, questing knights, knights of the realm, battle pilgrims, the grail relic key, and the damsels of heavens, beasts, and life. For my mid game composition, of course I've still got my lord. I would save the final amount if I were you, so just sink points into improving the rest of your army and keep this guy a little safer in those mid-game bouts. I'm going to pick up a Damsel of Heavens, getting some magic into the army, going with Lore of Heavens because I value cinematic damage over all things. With those early spells, she should give you plenty of help in battle with a little damage and utility where needed. Just keep them battling and grinding XP to get those later spells as quick as possible. For the front lines, we're going to go with two Polman at arms and four Battle Pilgrims. We're upgrading to Polmans and just going with two of them to stick on the outside of your front lines to protect them from any enemy charges. They have great defense and work well versus enemy large targets, so try to focus on them if possible. Battle Pilgrims will be taking on everything in the middle of the front lines, such as other infantry, and doing some damage whilst holding them still for ranged and cav to pick apart from afar. They aren't the toughest, they'll do the most damage, but they do the job as well as anything you have access to at this stage. The Peasant Bowmen are going to upgrade to Pox Arrows to do some poison damage to debuff enemies and make your army's job that much easier. Aside from that, use them pretty much the same. Just consider spreading the love a little bit more rather than the laser focused one thing. That being said, if there is a major threat, be sure to laser it away as it will go down surprisingly quickly. For the Cav are upgrading to some Knights of the Realm, getting some actual decent Cav into the mix now. These boys have so much charge bonus that most mid game infantry will crumble after just a few charges. Of course, they will require a lot of micro, but if you can keep on top of them, they will do great work and rack up an astonishing amount of damage. Take out back lines and front lines alike, just don't get pinned down or you'll be a very sad boy, and your horses will be dead boys. Closing us out, we have two field trebuchets. These are a pretty basic artillery piece with high range and a decent chunk of damage from that range. Keep them on your back lines behind the bowmen and firing at large clumps of enemies to maximize their impact. 
The strength of this composition, pretty much everything has been improved. Got more damage on the front lines, magical value is now online so you're making full use of all battle mechanics, and you have super strong cav that can carry you if you can micro them. The weaknesses however, the bowmen still aren't going to be doing a ton of damage, so if you lose your other damaged troops, they aren't going to keep up. You still have the leadership problem for quite a few units like ranged and the poor men at arms, so make sure they are confident and as close to the lord as possible. And of course the lord hasn't gotten any better yet, so it's going to start to drop off if you don't keep him close. Finally we come to our late game composition. For this we have access to tier 4 units which are foot squires, grail knights and pegasus knights, and tier 5 units which are royal pegasus knights, royal hippogriff knights, blessed field trebuchets and grail guardians. For my late game composition, of course still being led by that lord, who should now be on hippogriff mounts to get a massive power spike. He can now fly around battles, taking on almost anything and doing great damage to whatever you send him against. Just make sure he doesn't get pinned down and isolated, otherwise he will fall very quickly to armor piercing or anti-large damage. The Damsel of Heaven should now have a full spellbook, as well as Unicorn mounts, to be able to provide spell support all over the map. You still want to keep her out of combat since she isn't the best, so run her around and keep her out of enemy reach, or you'll be very sorry. We're going to keep two Pullman at arms, but we're going to upgrade to four Foot Squires for the middle. These are the top of the line great swords with big armor and armor piercing damage. They will go in the middle of your front lines and melt anything that comes at them. Now they aren't the toughest in the world, so against anything else late game, they will take some hits, so keep them supported with ranged and cav to keep them alive. We're dropping two of our pox peasant bowmen to make room for other units, so we can which two royal hippogriff knights, taking these lads for some air superiority. They have low model counts, but each one hits like a truck and is built like one too. They work great for taking on other flying units, as well as getting around the enemy and taking down ranged and front lines with ease. Keep them on the move and out of sight from enemy ranged, as they have nowhere to hide. Going to go with four Grail Guardians. These are endgame ground-based cav, and yes, I've gone for Guardians because they are so much easier to use and require less micro. If you are a micro god, then of course, going for Grail Knights will net you more damage as they are far more devastating at charge. But Guardians aren't slouches. They still do brilliant damage and can even be left in combat without dying instantly and do great damage whilst they are there. Send them around the enemy lines and either into ranged troops or the backs of the front lines and leave them in for a ton of damage and some dead enemies. Just make sure they don't get totally surrounded, as they will not be able to escape, and will fall quickly to AP and anti-large en masse. Finally, we're upgrading to two Blessed Field Trebuchets. This is a very slight upgrade, they gain a nice boost to damage, more ammo, and magical ammunition, so any resistances will cut straight through. The best part about these lads is the fact that they cannot friendly fire, so toss them at your front lines as much as you want, and you can be free from damage. The strengths of this composition, we're getting some powerful air superiority in the form of the Cav and the Lord, which are great for getting around the backs of enemies. We're also getting very powerful cav for sustained battling, so not too bad on the micro. And the front lines are actually now doing some damage, which is a miracle for Bretonia. Unfortunately for the weaknesses, still no improvement on ranged infantry. The poison is nice, but you'll need to focus fire to take anything out of this stage. You can't get a flying mount for the mage, so your magic spot is limited in speed and maneuverability. And anti-large on the front lines is still made up of peasants without much leadership, so any strong opposition, and they will turn tail quickly. And finally, to close us out and show you how this army composition performs in battle, I will pass you over to live commentary miles. Takes away. Thank you very much for that, Miles. For the final time, here we are against the Empire. That's right, this is the last army composition for Warhammer 2. So, the next army composition video you can see, probably going to be for Warhammer 3, so that's very, very exciting indeed. As you can see, I've deployed a little bit different to how I actually did in uh, showing off the army, mostly because it's uh, much easier to show off the army in one block, uh, but I figured that this would be a little bit better. So, I have my uh, Pox Arrow Bowmen in the trees. They're going to move up to here to stay hidden, so they don't get taken apart by the Hellstorm Rocket Batteries, because like one or two volleys of that, and then we're going to go down rather quickly. Moved all my infantry to this side to try and kind of flank around and attack them from this side. Of course, not infantry is particularly fast, so it's going to take them a little minute to go there yeah 28 and 30 speed Ooh, not blazing whatsoever but the blessed field trebuchets have a ton of range so they're going to be firing right out the gates focusing down any of the enemy great swords that we possibly can maybe some of their cav as well we shall see on the left hand side here we of course have my grail guardians moving in and they're going to move around and uh, try and well get around the backs of the enemies on the sides and take them out as quickly as possible and the same thing can be said for the royal hippogriff knights who are going around over here and then they're going to go around into the back and i believe i'm about to send my lord around to uh, join the royal hippogriff any minute now probably speed this along until something happens since <laughs> well since we're going against the empire it takes a little while to uh, actually get into combat with them Do, there we go. I was about to charge in my Grail Guardians on this Hellstone Rocket Patcher that was exposed, but I noticed at the last second there is a unit of Halberdier, so I quickly pulled them away. While I'm doing this, I brought in my Damsel of Heavens and chucked in a Chain Lightning spell there. The enemy was a lot more clumped up when it was cast, so it actually did get a decent amount of value if we look at that. Yeah, 40 kills. I, of course, can't check the damage value because this UI sucks. Hopefully, then gets fixed in one three, but we'll have to wait and see. And there we go, I have actually moved my bowman forward and the pox arrows are doing some fantastic work here. Unfortunately, I didn't notice that the Demogryphonite Halberdiers are moving in. Uh, so yes, th this unit here is going to take some serious hits 
unfortunately for me, the other units of Democratic Knights is actually charging my pole arms. So uh, that's really not too bad. And then another unit of Democratic Knights, not Halberd is, is uh, charging my Grail Guardians, who should do absolutely fine against that. As you can see, I have both my units of Grail Guardians moving in. One unit is going to tell some Rocket that is unfortunately tangled with Halberdiers and will be tangling with those very, very shortly. And the other one is moving in, or looks to be on the enemy Lord. And then, of course, I have my Royal Hippogriff Knights both moving in on the Temple Hoth Luminac, Luminac Pyche, to prevent them from doing any large damage to my large targets, I suppose. I've also sent in my Lord to take on this Arch Lector, game eliminated off the battlefield as quickly as possible. Just get rid of the Lord, you get rid of a decent chunk of the enemy leadership. There we go, the army, the army, that unit of the Halberdiers, the Northern Marinas, has been warded off by the Peasant Bowmen. See, they don't do much damage, but there's just that many of them, 90 men per, uh, per unit, and they fire that much, and they have that much ammunition. It really does not matter in the slightest. There we go, moving in, my Great Swords. They're fine against the Halberdiers, which is not really the best, uh, the Denver of Night Halberds, sorry. Uh, but they'll do just fine. Going to bring this unit of pole arms into the backside of these Denver of Night Halberds, try and pull out my uh, Bowmen and bring them bring them around to fight onto these guards and take them out as quickly as possible. As you can see, I've kind of been a bit swamped by infantry over here, but because the Grail Guardians are so good, yes, they are taking some hits, but they're still doing absolutely fine. And when you combine that with the Lord and his Stand Your Grand buff, they are certainly not doing too bad whatsoever. My two Royal Hippogriff Knights are doing absolutely fine. They've been chunking everything they can over in there now, moving their attention to these handgunners and the War Wagon Mortars. You know, high value tags, War Wagon Mortars. You don't want to let them do um, something, that's for damn sure. As you see on the right here, we have a bunch of enemy ranged units that are just waiting to be charged by my Grail Guardians. Uh, but, you know, because I'm shit at micro, uh, it's taking a lot. There we go. Now we're charging in and we should be taking them out nice and quick. Uh, the Stirrer of Patrol Crossbowmen, they're doing flaming attacks. I'm not really too worried about that on my Grail Guardians. Uh, I should have another unit of them somewhere. Yes, there they are. I'll be sending them up and around to wherever they're needed shortly enough. And to be honest, from here, the enemy just kind of chain breaks. So I just kind of am sending... Uh, Cav and well everything around just trying to pick them off as quickly as possible uh, Just break them make sure that they do not come back and that their leadership breaks and I can trigger army losses as soon as possible uh, So yes, uh, I suppose for this battle, uh, you know, it's Bretonia. I'm not really the best at micro So my girl guardians uh, one units of them took way more damage than you should have it's these guys right They're still fighting the halberdiers because you know, I'm stupid and I didn't see them uh, so if I'd have microed that a little bit better, they would have uh, taken less hits, and that would certainly have been preferable. I really would like more of the punishment to be on my infantry, uh, but they were just so slow. It took them so long to get there. I probably should have held back with the Grail Guardians while the infantry got into position. Uh, but, you know, you live and learn. You live and learn. And uh, if you were doing this in your battles, I would highly suggest doing that and letting your infantry take the majority of the hits because they'll be cheaper and easier and quicker to replace than, um, than the cavalry, of course. As you can see, this big old clump in the middle here. I believe there's a comment of Cassandora or something. Either just been casted or about to be casted on these guys. There we go. I think it's coming any second now. But it does not matter because army losses is about to be triggered. As you can see, literally everything in the army is breaking. Oh, that combat of Cassandora is definitely going to hit some of my own guys. Ooh, sorry about that, men at arms, pole arms. That does not feel good. There you go. Everything on the enemy side is shattered. Army losses, as we said. Yes, definitely could have gone better this one. But, you know, I'm playing Bretonia. I'm not good at Bretonia. I'm pretty bad at Cav, so uh, I think this is about as good as you're going to get from me, folks. Uh, but yes, let's go into the stats for the final time in Warhammer 2. First things first, the Lord. Uh, as of course, I sent him against the Arch Legs, and look, he died and uh, got basically 37 damage value. Wow, that is pretty pathetic. Um, so with 1,420 damage value on my Lord, uh, he was taking out that Lord. He was uh, then looping around and flying around, taking out artillery, ranged units, anything that he can. He's a great Lord. I mean, he's a basic Lord. But what he is good at, he is really, really good at. He's super mobile, can take on pretty much anything and does a decent job at it. So I'm very pleased with his performance. And to the Damsel of Heavens. Because if she was on a flying mount, I would have been able to get her around more and utilized uh, that mobility to get spells more around the map exactly where they were needed. Because she was on that unicorn, it's a little bit more limited, which is a little bit sad. I would like to see her on a flying mount. But um, you got to play with what we got. So 69 kills, very nice. And 1,144 damage value. Not too shabby. A lot of that was with the initial chain lightning. And then that comment of Castanara didn't really do much uh, towards the end there. Uh, that chain lightning really did use all the winds of magic right at the start. So I was kind of sat there waiting for him to come back, uh, which has been unfortunate. Men at arms, pole arms, of course, weren't really fighting against much. They had a brief tangle with some Dermot Griff Knights, but you know, they didn't really get many kills. So 377 and 171. Honestly, pole arms i could take more leaving to me she could go full foot squires for all the armor and the armor piercing damage and you know not terrible leadership but pole arms do technically have better defense so if you were fighting against someone like the green skins 
uh, I, I don't know. It'd probably be about the same between foot squires and pole arms because pole arms are better defense, foot squires are better armor, but you'd have to make that call for yourself. But you know, you can take them all even they don't do great is what I'm trying to get in a very long winded way. Moving on to the foot squires now, we've got 522, 471, 318, and 34. How many hits? 34 damage value. Uh, yes, the infantry certainly didn't get much value this battle because the majority of the fighting was done by the cavalry. Uh, all of it that I did have. Uh, as I said, I should have probably just held the cavalry in reserve, let the infantry charge up, take some of those shots, take some of the initial charges, pull the enemy's attention away before moving around. Probably should have kept them hidden a lot longer, but I didn't. So this is what we ended up with. But yes, if I was going to do anything different, I would have certainly rushed these guys in a lot sooner and had them take the majority of the punishments rather than the cav. And then the cav probably have mm, a few less kills, but also a lot less damage on them. Onto the peasant bowmen now. Of course, their damage isn't the best in the world, but 542, 210. That was only got charged, so they did retreat for a little bit and then went firing for a lot. So that's why their damage value is so much lower. 547 and 640, uh, 56 even. Uh, so yes, the poison damage. You really just kind of want to, because it's poison damage and at this stage in the game, they're focus fire. I mean, if the enemy has a war mammoth or something, you know, a big single target that you really desperately need to take out, peasant bowmen do a surprisingly good job. And with the poison damage, it'll just debuff them and make that even easier. But if you're just going against something like the Empire, where they a lot of their strength is quite spread around the army rather than being held in any one unit, there's nothing wrong with just setting up the bowmen where they're in range and just let them fire whatever they can comfortably fire at because they'll be spreading that poison damage throughout all the enemy troops, which will be debuffing them, making it easier for the rest of your army. There's really not a bad way to use poison damage as long as it's going onto the enemy. There's not really much you can complain about, to be honest. So yes, definitely... Could have done better defending them, but I'm not too upset with that performance. Uh, come to the Grail Guardians now. Of course, this unit took some severe hits, so that is not the best. But it did get 105 kills while doing it. And then we've got 815 value, 867, 1232, and 666. Uh, Grail Guardians, as I said, if you are better at micro, Grail Knights all the way. You'll do so much better. The charge bonus is devastating. If you, uh, if you want to use that wedge formation, uh, I don't know if... I, 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 I mean... I think wedge formation is cool because, you know, it says adds more charge bones, but the actual impact is less. So I don't know. Use it at your own discretion. Experiment. Doing your own thinking. Uh, I think the charge speed and the charge bonus that it is increased by probably is like negated by the fact that they hit in a point. So the actual amount of entities charging isn't as much, but I digress. Yes, if you're good at uh, cav charging, then certainly use those more. But if not, Grail Guardians are a great unit. You saw how much damage that unit took. It wasn't retreating and it was doing a fine job, even against Halberdiers. Something that does arm pierce. Mate, do they do arm pierce? Something that does anti large damage. I know it does that. It did just fine. It didn't break. It didn't die. It took a lot of hits, yeah, but it was doing fantastic about how surrounded it was. They're a great units. Honestly, if you were playing Bretonia and you really want to and you had money to burn, you could probably just bring Grail Guardians as your front line and not have any meal infantry whatsoever because they're that good. So do with that what you will. On to the Royal Hippogriff Knights now. We have 1,631 value and 1,240 value there uh, with 97 and 62 kills. These guys are fantastic. Of course, they're a flying unit, so they are the most maneuverable thing on the map unless the enemy has anything that's flying. If the enemy does have anything that's flying, chance that these guys will be able to take them out because they're multi-entity whilst also having a good chunk of armor and a good chunk of armor-piercing damage. So combine all that together, something in the sky, if there's a dragon, they can probably take it out way easier than the dren can take them out so definitely a fantastic unit and of course they have brilliant charge bonus and a ton of speed so it's not really a bad way to use them get them into the backs of the enemy lines take out their artillery like i did take out ranged troops and then once you're ready charge into the backs of the enemy front lines and they'll probably do just as well once we get into armor three and eventually all the maps combined and you can toggle their flying they'll probably be even better and finally the blessed field trebuchet 730 and 1,122 damage value, despite having less kills, which I always find very, very interesting. I wonder what he was firing at. Of course, they have massive range, magical damage. If the enemy has any resistances, of course, targets them with these guys because it'll cut straight through and they will not feel it. So don't be afraid to send it onto your front lines because those blessed projectiles, whatever you want to call them, they, of course, don't take any friendly fire damage. So you don't really have to worry about it. They're a great unit. They have great range. Of course, they're a little bit basic, but it's Bretonia Bay. What do you expect? At least you get a trebuchet instead of a pathetic catapult. So I'm very happy with those guys. And very happy with this army overall. Apart from maybe a return of course. But yes, I believe that does actually conclude everything. And that does conclude this entire series on how to build army comps for every single faction in Total War Warhammer 2. As I said, next year, hopefully, as long as we get no more delays, you'll be seeing videos similar to this Warhammer 3. So be very, very, very excited for that. And of course, I have many, many plans between now and then. So be sure to stick around and subscribe if you want to see those. Uh, leave a like if you didn't and leave a comment down below to tell me what you think of these compositions if you have any changes that you would make of course i'm not great at bretonia so if you have any improvements i'll be very happy to take them on and leave them down in the comments below would appreciate that very much thank you
as I'm saying, every single video until the year is up. The Christmas swear merch is available until the end of the year. And also you can get 10% off every single thing store wide using code FESTAG2021 until the end of the year. So definitely be sure to make the most of both of those while you can, because once the year is up, that discount is gone and this merch is gone. You may not be able to get it again. So definitely be sure to check out while you can. Also, if you'd like to consider supporting the channel more directly, you can become a member here on YouTube, you can become a patron on Patreon, or you can become a subscriber on Twitch. Doing any of these gets you all sorts of things like shoutouts, such as HBLC and Henry Tugger for their support at Bound Clean Ones today. I really can't thank each and every supporter enough. One more thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.